How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of your favorite Sunday podcast, Scales and Tales, episode 142. We're joined by uh by maybe maybe the the most um oh man, I don't even know what kind of title to give you. Uh, you guys, you guys might watch. You guys might watch this guy on uh, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Uh, elite. If you guys are an elite uh, person who tunes into those, you may have seen this guy a couple weeks ago. He's kind of a uh, kind of a hot shot, especially out on Lake Fork this last year. He's shaking his head no, but you guys can draw your own conclusion from uh, from what we saw that Saturday. Super cool showing. So I guess if if you're unfamiliar, we're interviewing Mr. Matty Wong tonight, uh, and we're gonna we're gonna get his story from the beginning, how he got into fishing, and kind of go chronological order. It's going to be primarily focused on swim baits like every episode is, but we're also going to talk about the Elite Series and kind of what it was like getting into that and fishing against a lot of these guys and, and kind of how swim baits play, uh, have and, and play a role in tournaments and when to pick them up and when to set them down. I feel like this will be a good conversation and a good uh, statement to kind of uh, hammer home that swim baits are a tool and not necessarily a lifestyle. I feel like a lot of guys, uh, myself included, you know, you go through that point in time where it's swim baits, swim baits for life type thing. And and yeah, that can be the thing, but with what Maddie does, it's, it's kind of not necessarily the golden ticket every, uh, every tournament. So without further ado, uh, Maddie, I guess you can introduce yourself and then we'll kind of get into how you got into the whole bass fishing scene. Right on, man. Wow. What a, what an intro. I appreciate that. <laughs> that was great. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I've been eating up with fishing my whole life. Um, it's something ever, ever since a young, young, young kid, I, I, as soon as my dad, uh, put a bamboo rod in my hands and we were catching tilapia, uh, on like the side of a canal, like I've been absolutely eaten up by it. Um, for those who, you who don't know my story, I grew up on the Island of Oahu in Hawaii and, uh, I lived there until I was about 25 years old and then moved to California with, uh, the dreams to be a star, you know, like everyone goes moves to LA. It's yeah. like, um, everyone has like a, a dream in the industry or in entertainment. And through that journey, I, I found that ultimately fishing is the, the anchor fishing is this thing that keeps me, um, you know, pretty balanced and centered. So it's, it's kind of, kind of cool on how I was able to take it full circle and bring it back to a place where, yeah, now it's, uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely crazy that I get to do it for a living. Yeah, man, that's so awesome. I'm kind of, I'm kind <laughs> of excited to hear your whole perspective on it and kind of, kind of what it's like, uh, starting, you know, I mean, I guess, is there kind of a lot of bass fishing opportunities on the islands or is that kind of more mm -hmm. of, uh, you gotta, gotta go to the mainlands to, to do it? For sure. Yeah. I definitely have to go to the mainland. Um, if you want to make, if you want to do anything with it, um, I mean, besides enjoy it, I, yeah. I think every that's where the, the 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 thread that runs through all of us is that we're just all anglers at the end of it, and we just enjoy it so much. And um, you know, fishing for bass in Hawaii is a very small group of us. Um, there's probably new and most everyone that like to go to the lake and enjoy bass fishing. Um, my whole life until. You know, until now, there's a whole new surge of, of people that are enjoying it, which is really cool. Um, there's a couple old little sneak holes, like little, you know, it's like the cow pond here, you know, that is absolutely on fire. Uh, we would have a couple cool locations like that that were just um, absolutely incredible. You're, you know, the backdrop's a, a rainforest and you, you have a pond that is chock full of, you know, three to four pound smallmouth. So it's, it's, it, it was uh is definitely unique growing up in a place where typically it's not known to be like a bass place right. so um you know i think uh we mainly on a walk at least fish for peacock bass and peacocks are the the main the main predator there because they they bully out the, the large mouth and and then the small mouth are in the streams which is really fun so it's like you know, you're hiking through a rainforest and catching smallmouth out of super skinny water. It's super sick. Man, that sounds um, so awesome. <laughs> it's wild. That's so sick, man. Did uh, <clears throat> so was your bass fishing experience up until you moved over to California? Was it primarily on the island, or did you kind of get your feet wet flying over here and kind of doing a little bit of bass fishing? You know, uh, that's a great question. My my dad uh, 
grew up in Hawaii, moved to California to go to college. And when he was in California, I think that's where he developed his love for, for bass fishing. And he brought it back and introduced that to me as a young boy. And um, so up until I moved away, all of my experience was either from a small tin boat that we had to fish Lake Wilson mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then, or they're like bank fishing. And so it's, I, I've been always constantly uh, in and around like picking and okay being able to like read a bank or whatnot uh, read read the water and also i mean kind of given growing up in hawaii that we're surrounded by the pacific so obviously i, I did a lot of saltwater fishing as well so i think that all those things kind of came into play when i then moved to california um and and that wasn't my goal there ultimately like it, that it's something that that uh it it came to be which i think is kind of like a the cool arc of life right and um i think ultimately i was i had a dream uh, and i wanted to go out and experience life and struggle and all this stuff by moving to california mm -hmm. but through life and through ultimately it just wanting to you know pull me into a place where you're more mentally with it you're more positive you're more absorbed in the in the environment you're and then you're eaten up by obviously the whole hunt of it all yeah the vast majority of double digit bass caught in mexico are caught out of two lakes lake Bacarac and lake el salto josh daniels pro bass adventures is the only outfitter in mexico with lodges on both of these trophy lakes with a fleet of ranger boats at lake el salto and live scope plus at lake Bacarac. Pro Bass Adventures has the best equipped guides and boats in Mexico. Better call Pro Bass, 480-491-9300 or probassadventures.com. We are Mexico Fishing. Staring at that peanut butter and jelly like a largemouth staring at a dollar store worm? Then it's time to upgrade your snackuation. Meat Crafters line of handmade, small batch, pre-sliced salami and charcuterie make the perfect base for your weekend snackle box. Fill a Plano 3600 with an assortment of Meat Crafters old world style salami and charcuterie and you're sure to become the boat ramp champ. Listeners of Scales and Tails can use scales and slices at checkout on MeatCrafters.com to save yourself 10% off your cart. The code can be used as many times as you want so you'll never run out of fuel in your pursuit of giants. The next time you reach into the fridge to load up your boat cooler, skip the fish food and grab a stack of Meat Crafters pre-sliced snacks. They are guaranteed to exceed your PB. I've got three words for you. Lake Pro Tackle. Lake Pro Tackle has all the gear you need to be ready to have a successful day on the water. Friends of the podcast receive 10% off your orders while using code SCALES at checkout. Checking out code SCALES not only saves you guys some money, but it also helps me host more giveaways to give back to you guys, the listeners. On their website, you can find exclusive and rare swim baits, JDM and BFS products, and of course, conventional tackle. I can't forget to mention Lake Pro Tackle gets the monthly throwback shop colors at the beginning of every month. Also, orders over $50 get free shipping, including rods. So do me a favor and remember to use code SCALES at checkout to save 10% at lakeprotackle.com. That's where in California is really where I dove into like specific techniques. Because once you do certain things in Hawaii, it'll basically, that that's a, that's a, a, a good pattern that will run throughout the year yeah uh, there's a handful of things that so we have there's bass on oahu and then there's bass also on Kauai. okay and uh the bass on oahu it's mainly peacock bass if you're fishing the 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 lake and then if not you're going to go up to the streams and catch a uh, smallmouth um so when people are like oh i'm going to go to hawaii and catch a largemouth i'm like good luck buddy because <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you'll go out for i mean you'll go out for weeks on end you won't catch a, a largemouth and then you'll go roll up on like a freshly downed bush. Uh, it's all all green and healthy, and you flip into it and catch three largemouth out of it. Like it's just it it's it is the the most uh, like unpredictable fishery. I've never seen a bedding largemouth uh, in Hawaii uh, ever, and, and I've caught I, hundreds, if not thousands, of bedding peacock bass. So it's it's really fascinating to see the predator shift and the dynamic there, but um, not to get too far off a tangent. Um, I think when I, I think when I moved to California and learned that okay, you can actually make money doing this yeah. as like a side hustle. I was like, well, why don't I just combine both of my two favorite passions and throw them together? I'm like a competitive person. I used to like surf contests and 
I mean, uh, to sports growing up and, and whether it was hockey to paintball to, you know, uh, a, soccer or whatever it was it was always like being having a competitive aspect and then but the whole time fishing has always been there too so it's kind of neat how i was able to combine them both um but yeah uh i talked about my dad um going to california and, and really diving into uh bass fishing on a whole his best friend would inherently became like my uh on a like unofficial official uncle Yo, yeah, yeah. who was like my bass guru. And so my uncle Bob growing up, who he was the first person to send me a pack of zoom flukes. Oh, wow. And like, he was a person to like, tell me about, you know, Texas rigging. I'm like, there was no YouTube back then. Uh, and if you had a subscription to Bassmaster magazine, like that was the only way that you can get tackle in Hawaii. Wow. And so a lot of the stuff that I got was my uncle Bob would just send it to me in the mail. And I would be like the kid, like open it up, like whoa, what is this? Like this is crazy. And it yeah. was like one pack, you know. And that <laughs> one pack was going to stretch me literally for like six months. Wow. Because I would, I would just like reuse it, and like it would teach me to like re repurpose a bait over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Because it was all that's all we had. It was not like I didn't have like more stuff that I can just go to a Bass Pro Shop and pick up another pack or like yeah. a tackle shop. So, um, my uncle Bob. Uh, in 2015, he was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And um, he was the guy who had taken me under his wing when it came to fishing and my father that when it came to bass fishing, um, he was the one who would, we would go out on family vacations and visit him in California and go fish like, like Folsom. Um, and uh, so it was kind of like this really heavy time where I was like kind of struggling in Los Angeles and things were kind of rough there. I was missing home. And I just wanted to get back. And I, uh, my uncle in, in the end of 2015 passed away from his brain tumor. And um, I asked his wife, you know, like, what'd you do with Uncle Bob's boat? And she was trying to sell it. Like she had put it on consignment somewhere. And she's like, you know, I know that he would want you to have it. So uh, I'm like, well, name, name your price. Yeah. And I bought my first bass boat. And a 1993 64 Comanche with like a 150 on it, basically no graphs, has like a one little six inch uh, Lorance up front. Yeah. That like half the time, if I'm in the middle of the creek channel, it shows me that I'm like 10 feet up on land somewhere. <laughs> but um, that was like my vessel that I uh, li literally and figuratively had to reshape the next like I would say seven years of my life. Like I I fallen in love with that so much that I would go up and spend weeks on end up in the Delta. I was running a photo business in Los Angeles. And so every time that I would have like a, a free week or whatever, mm -hmm. I would rip up North and go grab the boat that I had parked up in a, a lot up there. And I would borrow my, my ex-girlfriend's dad's truck. And it was like, it was <laughs> like, it all, it all worked out or yeah. it was, I would spend these full weeks up on the Delta, like learning how to punch, learning how to flip, learning how to frog, learning all these grass specific techniques versus in Hawaii, you know, it was very, very uh, finesse techniques, very like everything was like light line, finesse, not too much power fishing, but like power fishing, but finesse power fishing, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then uh, when moving, like really getting into the California stuff, like, and that's where the swim baits also, right mm -hmm. came into play so it wasn't until i really spent a time on the delta where guys are like oh dude you don't have a rat on your boat like what are you doing yeah. you know like, like you should have a rat on your boat i'm like okay and so then i just learning more and more from all these different you know whether it's like underground swim bait guys in norcal or if it was like you know guys that would only fish local ponds during trout stock time in like la county there were all these people that were so influential to me in the swim bait and 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 learning how to then how do you then um break apart of whatever you're trying to fish and be as efficient as possible and whatever technique that you're choosing dang man yeah that's pretty that's pretty crazy quite the story so <laughs> sorry i go i go i go off tangent like no, dude, you're easy, good so. you're good people people are listening listening to this because they want to hear you talk they they hear me talk for 145 <laughs> episodes they don't they don't mind what i have to say so um when you get over here i guess did you have um the ambition or was it in the back of your head that 
you wanted to kind of fish tournaments. I'm sure that was something you heard all the time growing up and, and obviously reading the uh, elite series or the Bassmaster magazines and, and probably seeing stuff here and there. Was mm -hmm. that something that had interest you before you had moved over here? And was that something that you were kind of interested to get into? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that it, op, the opportunity was there now. Right. Yeah. And I had he heard a couple other guys that were, you know, there was a guy that was uh, in the surf industry who was a commentator. His name's Todd Klein. He's fishing pro ams there as a, like a he was like a, a co angler at the time. He's like, yeah, I made like forty grand this year. I'm like, wait, what? Like yeah. fishing like on the side? I'm like, that's yeah. silly. And so uh, that's kind of what sparked it initially. And then from there, um, I I brought my boat down from NorCal down to Los Angeles. And that's where I was really studying on uh, Castaic Lake, where Air Martins is from. Mm -hmm. um, Castaic Pyramid, Piru, Casitas, like, all those lakes have become my new study. Um, and joining the, the, the Bass Club out of Ventura was really what kind of like got me going in the competitive scene. Yeah. I wanted to, I was literally that guy was like on Google, like, how do I start tournament fishing? <laughs> it's yeah, also yeah. like, think about it i'm like that's so silly but it literally was what kicked it off and i found this club ventura county bass club and um they're like yeah come out fish one of our events is like a guest and uh we'll see if you like it or not and we'll just go from there i ended up winning the the tournament and they're like who the hell is this kid like okay you got to pay your membership now dude. yeah like, all right free. yeah it was funny because they're like yeah well it technically doesn't count because you wasn't you weren't a member but uh it, it was it was funny because i i'm like all right well i'll, I'll be a member now and yeah. now i want to whoop your guys butts even more so yeah. it just it kind of sparked that fire underneath me and um yeah in 2019 was my first year i really i did a uh, fast nation as a well i did it as a non-boater i fished that first event with them in 2018 and then um i think 2020 the year of covid i ended up fishing all uh all the all of the qualifiers for bass nation as a boater because that was something i i just i figured that i'd do since i had it i had the boat and had uh had the drive to do it and so i made it all the way to the regionals and almost winning there on a pretty hard fishery um that it fit my style because it was something that i really enjoyed but lake havasu you have <laughs> delta conditions and then you have like Castaic and clear, clear lake conditions where you have all these like mixtures of all these fisheries that come together. Yeah. Um, and you have smallmouth and largemouth. And I ended up almost uh, winning that event on a glide bait. Wow. And on mostly smallmouth. So for those of you guys have, that haven't seen it before, and I would encourage you to, that if you go on to my YouTube channel, Maddie Wong Fishing, you can go back in time, back in the archives, and type in um, like, Western regionals 20, like, what is it? It was like 2020 or something like that, 2021 and go back and watch me with no graphs and with a glide. And I had fish in particular places timed out uh, where I was, I had them down to like a schedule yeah. and it was, uh, I basically did all my damage with a jerk bait and, and a glide. And so it was, it was neat to, you know, have that moment there with that old boat and then go to Wachita river with that same old boat and then end up winning it there. And that's what ultimately qualified me for uh, the elites. And that's like, obviously a condensed, uh, fast, like shortcut version of it all. Yeah, but, yeah. um, yeah, it's pretty wild. Yeah. That's so cool, man. They had talked about it, um, Saturday when you were fishing. So I don't, you may, you may have recorded the event and watched it, but they had kind of touched on at one point in time where, where they had talked about your story and they're like, yeah, he qualified on an older boat with no graphs. And, and now he's kind of had to, to learn this stuff to, you know, to compete with all these other guys who have this technology. And it was just a super cool, you know, wholesome full circle story of kind of like, this is, you know, this, the kid got into it with the bare minimum and now he's kind of got to, got to bump himself up when the, you know, technology and, and gear and stuff to compete. And it's just mm -hmm. kind of a, kind of a crazy crazy story if you think about it, it, it it's kind of like the uh 
you know, like the, the small scrawny kid who makes the football team and, and has the game winning touchdown. Like it's like, uh, yeah. like an underdog <laughs> story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of like the me. underdog <laughs> story. And, and, you know, if somebody listening to this who has a 1991, you know, bass cat or something be like, Oh man, like, you know, Maddie did it a couple of years ago. Like what is stopping me from doing it? If mm -hmm. I, you know, if I know the fishery and kind of can, can get a bite figured out and put the time in, like, there's really nothing stopping you, honestly, to, mm -hmm. to kind of, work your way to to winning like that i i agree man uh, it, it's not like it's something that i planned out and i'm calling my shot like of course but it's the fact that i the dream is was there and, and that ultimately you're you're you have that drive and you have that passion and don't tell anyone don't let anyone tell you that it's not possible i mean everything is within reason and so you want to make sure that you're finances and yep. your other things are in place first you don't want to be irresponsible about it but um you know when i was running my own business in los angeles and and i i had the means to be able to pop out and go and focus in on this stuff like it that's where it just completely ate it up and ate me up with it and um it's it's crazy the 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 amount that i've had to kind of learn the past few years being mm -hmm. on tour, especially with all the new technology. And uh, like, I, I didn't, I literally had, I didn't have uh, like my bow graph was a X92, which is a 2D yeah. black and white Florence yeah. <laughs> with zero map. My mapping was all on my iPhone. Right. Like I, I would literally pull up, I'd pull up Navi and that's how it run. And um, I had to do it all with uh, 13 gallons of gas. So wow. it was like, making sure that i'm like okay i got 13 gallons okay well, like what's my range and <laughs> it was just yeah it's, i look back on it now and like you know where i've kind of adapted to and now i'm like okay gosh it's like uh like 50 gallons gonna be enough for like you know <laughs> right, I'm just yeah. like having to calculate i'm like dude you had like literally like 13 gallons of gas <laughs> so it's you know, it's funny because you can, it, it goes to show you can easily overcomplicate things really fast. And I think that that was my first year uh, on tour was, uh, it was me overcomplicating things. It was me having every single new tool at my disposal and having all this new technology. And I was like a kid in a candy store. I'm like, well, well, I can go and do that, that, and that now. And then I can actually go run over, yeah. do a 20 minute run to go do that and that. And I'm like, you know, I, I, after that the first year and then the second year learning even more, I'm like, you know what, the more you can condense it, the more you can fish with confidence and fish um, bodies like a, a body of water that you can break down into a more manageable size. And that's when you become more deadly. I think guys that love to run all the time and like bump all over the place, not to say that that doesn't like be effective at times, but I found that if you're able to shrink your area get in a little milk run, um, if you will, and, and then be able to be like really efficient with that milk run and then dial in your timing. Um, you can be just as deadly if it's just someone who's running all over the lake. Heck yeah, man. Uh, so kind of rewinding it back before the tournament stuff, uh, fishing the Delta and kind of hearing, oh, you don't have a rat tied on that, that sort of <laughs> thing. Was, yeah. uh, was the rat your first swim bait that you ended up getting because you kind of felt the peer pressure too? no it wasn't it was actually the hud oh really <laughs> yeah it was the hud because i i had heard about this huddleston and i and i remember seeing guys at the pond like throwing a big old like hunk of rubber through there i'm like what like who you like coming yeah. from hawaii i'm like probably throw like you know you're we throwing dad wraps and finesse like jdm jerk baits for them and yeah. flukes and and then I'd come over here and i'm watching this guy throw an eight inch freaking plastic trout through the air i'm like what's gonna eat that yeah and in, then a park pond. I, in a park pond in a park pond you know like in a, in a small park pond and i watched a, a couple guys like jack some good ones and i'm like what's like what is this magic um and so they that's why the huddleston came into play and um it wasn't the six it was literally it was the eight inch because i had talked to a few people they're like yeah like don't throw don't waste your time with the six you know like it gets bit but like you the fish that you want are they going to eat the eight yeah and you'll be surprised at the, the size of the fish that you'll catch with the eight and so at the time it didn't make sense to me yeah. right and i'm like oh like why would a fish like eat that and then i would think about like how many times i would come across like a bass with a bluegill you know in his mouth like choked out or like another bass in 
the bass's mouth, yeah. like Bolt dead down or pop, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And it, then it, you realize like, oh, so the, a small fish can easily bend something that's eight to 10 inches in half and wolf it down as a meal. Yeah. I'm like, okay. And so it kind of like, it made sense because I'd seen the unimaginable with, with large mouth or sorry, with saltwater creatures mm -hmm. feeding on certain things. Yeah. Like when you were, if you were to see some of the baits that guys use to catch marlin, mm -hmm. you'd be like, there's no way you would bridle a 30 pound skipjack tuna through yeah. the eyes and slow troll it behind a boat to catch a 1200 pound blue, like, you know, black marlin or something right. like that you're like there's no way that that fish... yeah it's a big fish but there's like how does the mouth like the mechanics <laughs> like you know it's like it doesn't make sense and you're like no 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 it, it fully eats that yeah and so it 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 made me realize okay so now having that knowledge that bass aren't afraid to eat something that's like literally double like a little bit more than their size yeah and um and then the intrigue of all right let's go and like make a thousand casts and then get one bite but that one bite could be a trophy fish mm -hmm. and so i had, it was um it was my it was my my second year doing the bass nation my first year i did it as a co i remember the guy who won the event and it was on a, this lake called pint flat and uh it's a spotted bass fishery up in central coast california but they also plant trout there mm -hmm. and they plant um yeah they plant rainbows but what had happened was so the guy ended up winning it and he didn't know who i was i was just like this mere co-angler right yeah. and i'm like i'm like dude how'd you do it and he unthreatened by me obviously was <laughs> just like oh dude glide baits and i was like shut up like you glide he's like dude i glide bait like every single one of my fish and it it blew my mind because yeah. i'm like all right one like yeah there's largemouth in here but it wasn't the predominant species, mm -hmm. but this guy, like he obviously like absolute hammers. Like they, they had every single feeding point down to a T they knew like when the shadows were going to be where they needed to be when, like what, in what wind direction and X, Y, and Z of like where they sh should be for, to be like optimate uh, feeding windows. Mm -hmm. And so I vowed to myself, I'm right, fine all of 2019 after i got my butt kicked at the tournament i'm like i want to learn how to throw these things mm -hmm. and so i'll go to the ponds and i would mod out uh um and this isn't something that i've actually disclosed to a lot of different podcasts so this is like for someone who's already heard my story um this is something new uh, uh and i've done a, a few podcasts um <laughs> but i don't talk about how i got into like actual big bait fishing so the only hud that was available at the time was a floater mm. all the other sinkers were completely sold out i think it was like guys with that were fishing like central coast like deeper lakes and they, they just wanted the sinkers because you're fishing it from a boat but being a shore fisherman this is before i like i was i had my boat but i wasn't really fishing too much swim baits from it i i took this floater eight inch hud and i found that if i had weighted it perfectly I can essentially crawl it through every single LA city pond there was during the stock trout or during the trout stock and catch them. Yeah. And so I would, uh, I like put a, uh, a braided trap hook, mm. a treble hook on, on the rear adipose. And I would weight this thing. So it would sink like, maybe a couple inches every second like it was like a super super slow sink but i can as i would creep it everywhere i can if i felt something like i'd hit the nose and mm -hmm. i could back it off and then slowly shake it and bounce it up yeah. over the cover so it was like a four-wheel drive even though it had a stinger hook on it i can like basically confidently fish it everywhere i remember there's this one little city pond called kenneth Han. it's less than like a third of an acre but there's giants in there like i caught <laughs> I, there was a, a trout stock earlier that week. I caught it eight at like this, like 545. And it was this one line where I knew that they'd dropped off and it created this little like U shape. So whenever they, like the trout would funnel out, they would do their cir their same circle pattern. Yeah. And they would pull out the bigger bass would then pin them against this one wall. And so caught that eight, 
And the next day I went back and instead of going back at four o'clock or going back at four 30, I rolled at the park at five 30. There was a ton of people fishing all around me. <laughs> and I literally roll up and I was like, I, my buddy was fishing around. He's like, yo, I'm like, yo, you might, you mind if I'm, I make this cast? He's like, I'll do go for it. Like we've One been casting cast. here for the past, like whatever. I'm like, okay. Like bought my cat, like sink, sinking out my bait and like talking story with him. I started getting this little creep out. <laughs> stick it again it's like it's the same fish dude and it went from an eight pound to an eight and a half pounder um it had it ate two trout that were probably like 12 to you know in that 10 to 12 yeah uh, inch range and um and i and i got it and i was like and that one's off the stinger hook off the hood and uh i just remember like because there's all these things that i learned from other guys from the west coast they're like oh big fish don't bite two days in a row or well, big fish get spooked out by this or like you know like once you get a big fish like that fish isn't going to want to touch anything for a week and i'm like oh, okay so like that like that gave me the confidence for everyone that i that told me this preconceived stuff where it's like whenever someone tells you like yes and no in fishing that it's like they're full of crap because there's yeah. no way that they, like any of us know exact mm -hmm. but it opened up the world of me like oh big fish do eat two days in a row that's crazy it, like after you hook them yeah and they'll eat the very next day the same bait and after and the they've same bait two other trout after yeah exactly and and it, it just it, it showed me so many things about the big bait and the power of it and the power of timing so I think that, that was something that was uh, really crucial. Um, but yeah, that's where like my love of the big bait thing kind of like grew. Um, then I got myself like a Spro rat because it was like the cheapest rat at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I, I caught my first rat fish on the Delta. And um, But then I really wanted, because I got my butt handed to me on the glide, I was like, all right, okay, I'm learning the HUD. I got the HUD. Um, now I'm learning the glide bait, and that's when I I, I had like a Savage Gear glide, and mm -hmm. Oliver Nye sold me one of his old Mega Bass glides. Yep. And uh, and so I had like I kind of figured out a couple, just only two baits. It was only it was an ice slide and then a Savage Gear, and the Savage Gear was because um, with spotted bass having a shorter profile is something that's just way more beneficial to you as an yeah. angler versus having something taller easier for them to like compress and get in their mouth but that was something that um yeah i dedicated a lot of time to learning those few baits and fast forward five years later and uh a ton of more baits added to the collection and a lot more time added on the water i feel very confident with it enough where i'll throw it on national television if i'm only getting six bites a day <laughs> yeah dude man that's so awesome um Going back to the HUD, that just goes to show, well, oh, excuse me, that just goes to show how realistic those HUDs look underwater that a fish ate mm -hmm. it two days mm -hmm. in a row, you know, about 24 hours apart after it eaten two real ones a couple hours <clears throat> before, you know, the last feeding period before. It's just kind of a, a crazy story that, that I feel like guys can kind of hear and think, oh my gosh, you know, like I've never caught anything on a HUD, but you know, if I have, I bet you'd probably eat it again. You know, it's kind of a, kind of yeah. a super crazy story. You hear, you hear about guys catching fish, you know, a year later in the same spot, pushed up on the same cut or whatever it may be, but not, not necessarily, you know, a couple, you know, 24 or 26 hours apart. That's a, that's a pretty crazy thing. And, um, I mean, like I said, that just goes to show that when a big fish is hungry and, and there's a meal presented the way that it's going to, it's it's going to eat. And that was kind of, yep. uh, you were talking about um, <clears throat> the the bluefin and everything earlier, kind of eating, eating fish that just kind of blow your mind. And uh, it's that age old thing that a fish doesn't know how big it is. It doesn't have a mirror. It doesn't have a, a an iPhone to take a selfie and see how big it is. Like if it's enticed and you know, it has, it has a, a, a thought in its head that it wants to eat it. It's going to eat it. And, you know, that's why mm -hmm. you see those fish floating that have, you know, 14 inch bullhead stuff down their gullet or those huge, <laughs> you know, 11, 10 inch uh, bluegills that they just kind of get stuck in their goal. It's, <clears throat> they're kind of a, it's an interesting, you know, bass and just kind of fish in general are pretty interesting to see that you can, you can go out and fish a eight inch HUD and you'll catch a, a 12 inch fish. I mean, it's, it's absolutely crazy. Uh, Mike Gilbert had sent me a picture <clears throat> of a fish that he caught on the 13 inch tyrant. And I kid you not, the fish was maybe 15 inches, 15 inches. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> absolutely insane. And he's like, I wish I had yeah. a dollar every time that that's happened. And I'm just like, wow. Yeah. Like, 
you know, seeing that in California is, is crazy, but that's something, it, you know, you don't necessarily see a whole bunch here, but it, I mean, fish are kind of universal and it's just like, wow, that's, it's a crazy thing. I, I can, I can say it till I'm blue in the face, but that doesn't mean anything until you see it for yourself or you kind of mm -hmm. run across it and you're like, wow, you know, I kind of, that statement holds, uh, holds some truth to, to my perception now. Cool. So that's a, it's a super, super cool thing, man. So I guess when you were on the Delta and you were kind of hearing these guys talk about swim baits, were they, you know, uh, Caesar toxic is kind of like that, that main, that main one on the Delta and stuff. Did you hear guys yeah. talking about brands and stuff or was it more or less just, Oh, you need to be fishing a rat type type talk. I mean, there was a lot of hype in certain baits. I mean, it was when like, this was before Caesar had put out his whippersnapper. This is when he would just, he was like making his Wade hogs. Oh, and, wow. Okay. Um, so like this was, it was cool because it was like, all right, like I see the swim baits, yeah. you know, like I see the swim baiters and like the swim bait culture, yeah. you know? And so like, I, like it's where it was born, you know, in yeah. SoCal, like to see like, like the, just like the whole culture around it. Right. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, obviously I'm like, that's cool. But I'm like, but I, but I also like catching them like on a wacky rig yeah. or like, I like catching them on a cheddar bait. And so like, anything. if I drop shot a fish, are you going to like tell me I'm gay? <laughs> they will. They will. Like, they don't, you know, maybe not, maybe so, not so much anymore, but 20 years ago yeah. out in California, they would have, they would have seen that. <laughs> and it wasn't even 20 years ago, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, even, even five, six years ago, it's like, guys would be like, bro, what are you doing? And like, this is before like, at, like Ford facing became a deal. This is before like any of it, you know? And so this was still like where a lot of these guys, like were still just putting out batch baits. Um, I think, uh, you know, 316 was still out in California. Then um, you still had, um, there was, you know, like triple trouts were still being made. Um, uh, Andrew, Andrew was still making his hinkles and you can get them for 200, yeah. you know, 200 bucks, like before Jason started, like he was just painting baits then. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, it is really cool. Um, even though I've only been doing it for such a short amount of time compared to like some of the OGs in the sport, like, I feel like I've, I've been through now I've seen like the shift of the whole swim bait world. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just like, obviously wanted to see, like or get the respect of like the core swim bait guys mm -hmm. but at the same time i'm like yo bro like i'm not trying to fit anyone's mold like i'm a kid from hawaii that grew up surfing and then you know and i play the saxophone you know i'm like i'm like bro i'm not trying to like follow anyone's footsteps <laughs> yeah. these are like people that i look up to and i'm like wow if they, if they can do it like maybe i could right. make my own path but like it is what it is it's just uh I think that's the cool thing about the swim bait world that even though they, they know, you know, that I'm not like, uh, like die all swim bait guy. Like I was throwing a rip bait, mm -hmm. but like that I picked up at 86 and like slayed their face in on a doom rider I'm like yeah. that, like that bit, like made me so stoked to be a part of the, the swim bait community because that's when everyone was like, here, I'm at a swim bait. I was like, all right, sick. I'll take it. You know? Cause like I put in time with it, you know, I've gotten, I've gotten both sides of the, the, the kudos and the disses from like the core swim bait dudes. And it's like, eh. you know, it's like, if you enjoy fishing, you enjoy getting bit, like do what needs to get done to, to get that. And if um, throwing, throwing swim baits gets it for you all the time, like dude, that's epic, you know? Yeah. And if but if it doesn't and you just pick it up once in a while and it works out and like that's also epic yeah. and so i think that's like a a thing that i get a lot a lot of questions um uh, when people are they're interested and they're intrigued in the swim bait game and they're like i, I want to get into sw throwing them more what do i do i'm like one don't listen to what anyone else tells you like don't listen to like like oh you've got to yeah. th throw away everything else that yeah. you got you know i'm like well look if you take it as this golfer is going to want to get good at his short game as he's going to want to get good at his driver same thing i'm just as deadly with five pound tests and a neko rig that i am with 25 pound tests and a like 10 inch bait yeah so it's like having that gambit and those tools i feel will make you a more well-rounded well angler and ideally if you can get to the point where you have that same amount of confidence and when you pick up something finessey and pick up something that has heavy lines and, and like heavy weights and then you're 
I mean, that's those are the guys that I really get like afraid of, you know, especially like, yeah. and I've always looked up to guys like Brandon Polinick, who uh, he's like one of those guys, like mm-hmm. another West Coast dude, done his own thing, loves throwing big baits, but also, you know, kills him on a drop shot. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's so cool. And, and you kind of, um, I mean, picking California and SoCal, especially you, I mean, you, you were in the center of the swim bait culture and, and even, you know, you think, uh, you know, you haven't quote unquote been in, been in this, you know, swim bait world that long, but Mm -hmm. you look at 2016 or 2016 to even like to 2018 or 19 with how much it's changed in the last, you know, six to eight years, it's, it's crazy. You know, you talked about those guys who, we're making baits now, but I mean, at one point in time, I remember Hinkles were Hinkle trouts were selling for like 180 bucks. Yep. And, 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 <laughs> now, and now you look and, and you can't even touch one for less than 600 on eBay or if not way more. And it's yeah. like, Oh, that's crazy. And, and at one point in time, you know, everybody had to have a slammer and Huddleston. And now, yep. you know, that's, that's like the old boomer baits. Like I don't need a Huddleston. I have a, you yep. know, X, Y, Z soft bait that, is yeah. made or whatever and i don't i don't need a slammer i have this two piece you know whatever it may be yeah, yeah. kind of like it's kind of like wow it's it's not necessarily that the fish changed but the culture has changed and it's kind of mm-hmm. swayed swayed a little bit and even um i talk about it uh <clears throat> quite a bit you know making the magazine and obviously the podcast and, and videos and stuff kind of the media aspect side of things i don't think something like this would have been a thing in you know 2006 because it, people weren't worried about it. People weren't worried about yeah. the cool paint jobs. People were worried about catching the teeners that were swimming around in Clear Lake or or Pyramid or, or just, you know, Dixon, wherever yeah. it may be, going yeah. out and hucking the 8 to 10-inch Huddlestons at, the, at the park. Yeah, I mean, they were yeah. they were worried about the big fish. And now it's kind of like the, the renaissance time of the swim bait world. Like, you know, you got ABS baits. You got a, more custom painters than you can think. You got, uh, you know, ABS knockoff baits. You just got mm-hmm. all this stuff. And it's kind of it's kind of growing to a point where I don't think anybody had really thought of it being uh, past the cool kid thing. You know, it's still kind of the cool kid thing, but it's not necessarily like that cool click where you see one guy every three years who's fishing a Huddleston at the at the lake. It's more of you see a bunch of guys fishing ABS Chad Chad and that sort of thing at the at the boat ramp or whatever. So it's it's kind of cool, and you know, I haven't been in it that long i've been in it for six or seven years or so but just to see with how much it's changed in that short amount of time it's kind of like whoa like it's a very uh moldable market and kind of mm. uh niche group and it's it's, it's really mm. intriguing and it's it's fun to uh I, I talk about it quite a bit with people to kind of guess or assume what's gonna what's gonna be the big thing next year what's yeah, gonna nice. what how is the how is this gonna change in the course of the next two years to compared to what it's at now and compared to what it was at mm-hmm. two years ago so that's kind of that's kind of yeah. the fun that i see in the whole swim bait world and i think it is changing for the better whether whether guys believe it or not you know we're being more accessible and that sort of thing and you got guys like you who are on you know friday saturday sundays that are that are you know putting it on for for these uh tournament people and they can see that oh you know this maybe not necessarily the 86 but but these 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 you know uh expensive things with big price tags are are just like my drop shot i have or just like my chatter bait like it's something i can pick up or leave on the deck of the boat and i can catch one or two fish that may make a difference on making it to the mm. next day or getting a check or whatever so i think that's 100%. super cool like you guys on the elite series are kind of in a way like molding the culture as you guys go. And that's super cool. Cause that wasn't a thing, you know, that wasn't even a thing two years ago. It was pretty hush hush to, to see guys with <laughs> swim baits on tour. And I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's not uncommon to see it anymore. Yeah. It's, it's neat. Cause I think the guys that are like true swim bait dudes and versus the guys that like chase the bite, like I can, I can count like uh, guys that are like ate up by it. I would say you have like, Polnick, you got Steve Kennedy, you got Zaldane, you got Carl Jockinson, you got Milliken and Hamner. Yeah. And then also like as like a like kind of like a sleeper, but you'll never see him throw it, is like Patrick Walters. Mm-hmm. Like he's he he like nerds out on it a bit, but um and then Her- uh, Matt Herring. Um and uh I mean there's a there's a like a handful of other guys, but that's it. And everyone else is like, man, like, they'll be like, man, ah, you kidding me? <laughs> you're like, yeah. no, I'm barely throw a six inch mag draft, you know? Right. And so it's, it's, uh, 
it, it's there's definitely that and it's also fun because you can also use it in your advantage too right because in it's someone that's confident and with a swim bait with a big glide or a big soft tail that like in the right conditions that's more terrifying than some guy that's like on the winning school yeah. i'm like bro like that guy can like double our weight right now yeah, yeah. If, if everything comes together and i've seen it on like on many different occasions so it's uh yeah it's it's pretty cool to see and how um like you were saying the culture has changed a lot um going from you know where it was just like oh trout baits oh mm -hmm. huddleston oh segmented baits triple trout oh like you're or like the or you know the 316 you mm -hmm. know it's like uh you, you got and then from there it's like the the whole like oh oh dang how much are guys making for that and then they, yeah. they figure out that there's like oh i want to buy this market share right. and so they'll try and like climb into it make some like bunk bait and the other guys make like a great bait mm -hmm. and so i think the more baits that, that are coming around drives the market drives everyone that's consuming and also just it takes the level of guys of, of the artisan bait makers yep. and it, it brings them to the next level Wonderful. and i think that's where we're, we're, we're finding now is the guys that are really taking the time not only on the color but then your shape and swim mm -hmm. is like those are the guys that are going to set it apart because like there's even times where guys are missing the mark when it comes to like packaging yeah. which that might sound silly but now like being very part of the jdm world like packaging is like a third right almost. custom clam shell you know fits in there yeah, super just nicely like, everything yeah or even like a like custom glide that comes in like some dope bo box right. versus like you know something like in like a ziploc bag yeah. you know or envelope you're like oh cool <laughs> you know like <laughs> But like, not to say that those baits don't swim incredible. It's just like that's just how we're consuming now. We have so many different inputs and and things that we want to like uh, that drive us to buy. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it it's neat. It's it's I think it's made it more mainstream. I mean, even five years ago, I did a, a road trip with Oliver and I um, back during covid i mean literally as covid was like hitting west coast we're like bro let's get out of here <laughs> it's like we like, shot over to texas actually at lake fork and um you know it was it was something that like there was a handful of guys on the west coast or on the east coast that were doing it mm -hmm. um you know a few guys that were doing it in the uh, the midwest and whatnot um millican being one of them yeah. um you know and those before he really blew up on youtube um and uh and then like a few other people but it was it's cool to see how like it's kind of changed the stigma behind this change like people have gotten really behind it and really enjoy doing it because like see the what happens when you throw a bigger bait yeah. and like when a big fish engages and and ultimately if you can catch one yeah. it's just like that much cooler yeah i think um there's a handful of tournaments that have have like boosted the the swim baits in in the tournament world and that's obviously uh zaldane's lake fork tournament must have been 21 mm -hmm. i mean that video has i think like a quarter of a million views and i think i'm about two thousand of them i've watched that video a whole bunch where, where the shadow was spawning. when he was he was shatter spawning he's he's throwing like the tater hog and like yep, the, the mag drop hog. yep and he broke off like two or three tater hogs and lost that was them. in I think that was in 2018 or 2019. Well, okay. Oh wow. I thought it was. I thought it was yeah. sooner. 20 21. Later. I was. I was on tour then when we okay. came to Fork, and I. I think that was. Oh no. Sorry. 2022 is my first year on tour. So I don't know if they did back to back. Fork. I, yeah, it must have been 18 or 19. But I remember that as a fan watching that, and I think he ultimately got in second place that one or something yeah, like that. And, and like you said, that's like. And then and, and when you um, fork again a couple weeks ago when you were out there, I mean, those guys had to be watching Bass Tracker, you know, just just hearing about it, uh, you know, Friday night um, and just kind of hearing hearing people talk. I'm sure guys talk on the on the series where guys are like, oh, you know, Chris or, or Maddie like hammered them today on the glide bait. And you hear like, you hear. I mean, if I was a tournament guy, you know, that's used to you know fishing a whatever that's not a not a swim bait and you hear somebody say you know catch them on a glide bait or a mag draft or big boot tail your yeah. ear kind of your ears kind of perk up a little bit like oh man what yeah. am i going to need to do tomorrow to kind of yeah exactly get ahead of them to stay ahead of the ball and um yeah. it's just a super super cool thing i mean i uh lucky lucky luckily enough my job is pretty laid back so i could i could watch the fork tournament this year when when you were oh, catching wow. these fish and uh i was screen recording when you'd set the hook i'd hurry up and screen record it and i'd send it to matt 
and at one point in time you had caught you had caught a five uh-huh. and like uh 10 minutes later i think you had caught like another six or you you caught another really really good fish uh-huh. and uh my messages weren't sending to matt and so the one sent and the next one sent and he's like oh man that's that's a really good fish and i was like matt that's two different fish <laughs> like, oh my gosh dude, are you serious like you're like <laughs> being serious i'm like yeah dude and then i think that's kind of when you went on a tear and caught like uh two or three other ones and then you you unfortunately you'd lost the big one right at the boat and stuff and i i just um i had sent him all these and he was just i don't think he was able to watch it at that point in time but i I was trying to keep him updated because i'm like this is like if i was a bait builder and i wasn't able to i would want somebody to 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 be in my dms just just blowing up my message kind of showing me and uh he was like, oh my gosh, he's like, please just keep me updated with whatever happens. And uh, it was just super, super cool because I'm friends with a lot of builders and to, I mean, even, even as a builder, like when you mention them in a YouTube video or something, you know, not mm-hmm. something crazy public like that. I mean, when guys talk about the podcast, I'm like, wow, that, that like really means a lot. Like people are taking their time out of it. And yeah. for you, I mean, there's, there's a lot of glide baits out there, but for you to fish this one, one in particular and kind of know the builder at least be familiar with the builder i mean that's got to be on both ends of the spectrum for you it's just got to be a crazy good feeling to be catching fish especially in a situation like that and the bait builder i mean they have to be on cloud nine seeing a guy on national tv just hammering these fish on their bait and it's just like it's such a cool perspective and just the whole scenario of of a guy hammering fish on tour with a camera in their boat on tv it's just it's it's kind of a dream come true i feel like for both parties I appreciate it, man. I, I think you nailed it on the head. I It was one of those tournaments, even though I felt like, I mean, I, I had the fish to win it. You right. know, I feel like I was on the right fish and it was, uh, you don't get those opportunities a lot, but I think that that was such an impactful event for myself and for so many other people um, to like join my camp, uh, yeah. if you will, you know, where it was, I, I'm fine with them not hoisting a blue trophy on that event. If that, really really like hit home with a lot of people and I, I can't tell you the amount of people that have reached out over the fact that were like dude like it was so cool to see what yeah. you'd, you like how you had adapted your own style to do this and I, um i got to talk to matt and uh he was the most it was the most genuine heart-filled conversation i'd, I'd had with the bait maker so awesome uh and he it was it was to the point where like, I, I think we were both like simultaneously in tears, but we didn't want to admit it to each other. But he's like, bro, like, like that was the most like intense day that like, we've had in five years. Like, I can't tell you and thank you enough, like between myself and my family, like what that meant. And um, like being the underdog, being the kid that like grew up in uh, not a place where bass fishing is huge and not having the nice boats and whatever. And to support a guy that, is like a small bait builder that does like incredible craft work, but has a lot of integrity in his craft and just follows it hard. And to be able to like give back to that, like, Oh my God, it is like full circle, you know, it's so the awesome. universe doing its thing. So yeah. yeah, it was cool. It was a cool, it was a cool conversation I had with Matt after that event. And, um, and it, and the, the great, and I got to give a shout out to like my main sponsor, mega bass for being as cool as they are yeah, <laughs> with that yeah. all. Cause obviously 86 isn't a mega bass bait yeah but the fact that um you know what they knew that they still had a big player in in that which was my rods and so like I, it was just cool that it all kind of worked out in synergy um obviously uh i, I think not throwing one of their baits but i mean i caught them on the 110 too yeah. so i can't really discount it fully but yeah it's um it's cool. And I think that's like in the swim bait world, like I definitely have some fans that are like core swim bait dudes that are like, yo bro, like if it wasn't for you on the tour, like I wouldn't be watching it. I'm like, I'm cool with that. <laughs> you know, like it's, I, I think it's neat that I'm able to resonate with uh, the core swim bait dudes because, you know, I mean, anyone that knows my collection, like I'm just as much of a, a fiend when it comes to swim baits. Yeah. As anyone yeah, else. All right, guys, we're back. We had to take a little break there at the, uh go uh, go to the bathroom but <clears throat> so we're talking about uh maddie was talking about mega bass being super super dope with with you know fish the 86 baits um and that sort of thing and he kind of touched on uh he's fishing 
oh, excuse me, beer, beer burps. He's fishing the, uh, he, he's fishing the mega bass line of rods and everything. So mm -hmm. Matt is going to kind of go into depth on his setups for everything. We'll kind of close the chapter on, on the fork event and we'll kind of work our way down the conversation. Yeah. Um, you know, thanks for that lead. And I think with, uh, with a company like mega bass, I mean, everyone knows that it's, it's, when you're talking about a refined product that is years and years and years of testing, years and years and years of design, and it, this is proven. I mean, I don't have to speak for them. Uh, they, the product will speak for themselves. And um, obviously the, the one-two punch I had with this event was the 110 plus one. Uh, the vision 110 plus one jerk bait and uh and then this glide and just having the support for a from a company that's like like hey do your thing dude like if that's what if that's the bait you're gonna do it like do it and then you know we're here for you and um ultimately i i think with fishing for and this is speaking to tournament guys or speaking to guys that like to throw that like kind of like mid-range i call it a mid-range glide which is like that seven six to, let's just say six to eight inch range glide bait having a rod that you can effectively throw the rod tip down and grind them in and not be boring a giant hole in these bass's mouth you know and having enough parabolic bend but enough backbone as well to shut off where you need it to is super crucial um so i had two mark 56s was this their destroyer line um with uh i had a i was throwing a ds custom um and uh so i had a ds custom tied up and then i also had that matt's doom rider um with 86 baits and um you know for me 25 pound test fc sniper around timber typically i throw it on 20 yeah. um but like 25 pound um i mean a couple of times i would get them like hung on something and then they would come off and it, i was just retying and uh that was uh i think the culmination of all those like elements that came together i think really kind of made made it that much of an effective bite for me um a quick little tip for you know and this is a kind of a, a fun finding uh or or further cemented uh a, a theory of mine when when the fish are really committing to it to a glide bait and adrian i don't know if you feel differently but you can you can key in on this but um you know whether they're if they're fully committing to it then i and then i'll go to an ewg style bait or a hook um a more style ewg where when i i have that fish pinned i guess on most of the time that's not going anywhere uh, versus if they're slapping at it, then I'll go to like more of a round end based hook. Yeah. Uh, so all my, all my glides that I had tied up, all had one on EWG Gamakatsu short shanks with the magic eye. And, um, that was kind of like my go-to and especially for that, like seven inch size bait. I think that's like, it's a good hook that you can one with the 25 pound test with that destroyer rod that I was using it was it all worked perfectly together where i can horse those fish in yeah. like you, you know guys can go back and watch the nine pound catch like i literally like i didn't let that thing go anywhere right. you know like we were like bro you didn't even let that fish fight i'm like bro if you had a 10 a nine pounder at the other side of your line you wouldn't let it fight either mind you during um, during an elite event yeah. on Saturday. And during an elite event on national television where yeah. you got like half a million people watching you yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's, yeah, uh, it's it's one of those things you don't you don't want to give them a, a single inch because they'll take a foot and and i mean later on in that day that ended up happening I, I lost a fish that was bigger than the over that i had in the boat man i i i saw that and i just my yeah. heart you know i talking as the viewer i was just like yeah yeah of course and also i i could see a bunch of quarter like like a uh, monday morning quarterbacks too like oh, um because uh uh as as a as a uh, someone who likes to critique people, obviously being the biggest critic of myself, my um, my mechanics for that fish wasn't obviously ideal. Right. Looking back, like in the moment, right? There's so many things that you can say, like, oh, well, if I hooked that fish, I would have kept it going from one direction, and I wouldn't have let him jump, and I would have let. Him... You're like sick, dude. But with 10, 10 boats watching over your shoulder, a camera, and like I had hooked that fish, I brought it up. 
I'd seen it. It had the back hook. And this was the only fish out of all the fish that I caught had the back hook. And it was the only one that was just barely on there. And so I went into like, like pure panic. Cause like anything that like swim baiters know, right. You were, if you were to like go and try and circle that fish one more time, or like maybe like cross directions one more time, it popped. It popped gone, 10 out of 10 you know, times. that's just how like it works. 10, like it, it just how it works. And so I'm like, Oh my God, dude, this fish is done. But the thing it turned upwards. Like I got the head to turn. And so the, her, her head came up and I had four more reels on my re like on my rod that i could have taken to get down to hold that like i played this out many a times in my head now but like you know i had at least four rotations of the reel to keep the tension then they keep one hand on the rod and the other hand belly scooping it to land the fish and if i would have taken one more breath and really taken my time to take those cranks down to get to it what i did what i did was i seen the fish with that hook i had had that all that scope out i have long arms i I grab, I grabbed the line. I got the fish up. I dropped my rod. I actually scooped the fish. Mm -hmm. And this is the part where you can't see my hand is around the bass pinned against the side of my boat. And I had her, I'm trying to get my hands into her gills and she's not having it. I dropped my other hand when I had the line and I reach over. And that's when she likes, she pops Houdini's out and pops. And, uh, <sighs> and then like, 10 minutes later, I'd dump a seven on a jerk bait, but I already had like 30 pounds in the bag. So I was just like, well, shit happens. <laughs> I mean, dude, but, yeah. I will say, uh, obviously not on a big stage like that, but there's videos of me on the paddle board, uh, fishing. And I have, uh, I have a decently long handled net and I mean, I'll, I'll reel in a fish as far as I think. And I'm, I have my arm all the way extended back and I got my, <laughs> you know, I'm not fishing the elite series so I can have a yeah. cheater net. And I got my, I got that net extended all the way. And that fish is, is teetering on the edge of that net. Yeah, 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 it is yeah. just like, man, I know exactly what you mean. I've done it flipping fish all the time. I, you think you have enough line, you know, pulled up and, and you go to flip the fish and that fish is still a foot under the pier head or pier channel, like yeah. in my case. And, mm -hmm. and you bounce that fish off and you're just like, Oh my gosh, what do I do? Do I drop it back in the water? Do I pick it back yeah. up or, <laughs> and it's like seesawing on the yeah, side of the pier. And the fact that the fact yeah. that it had one hook in it in your yeah. experience, it's like, you know, you be damned if you do, you damned if you don't. It's like yeah. in the moment, yeah. nine times out of ten, that's what everybody would have done. I mean, it takes yeah. a real, real, real calm and composed person to 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 handle that situation with five yeah. stars. I mean, you you even look at guys like uh like Gilbert in some of his videos where he catches, you know. 11 12 pounders and it's it's just that you know that oh shit factor where you know you see watch them panic too and you can like if they're yeah. wearing if they're wearing like a road mic you can hear their hear yeah. their breath start to pick up and you can, yeah, yeah. can kind of just you're know, like man is is seasoned as somebody can be like you know the It'll wheels do, do fall off. the wheels do fall off for a lot a lot of people it takes a oh, real yeah. special person to be unfazed and you yeah. know like you said, everybody can can armchair quarterbacks. Oh yeah, he, Matty should have done this. Matty should have done that. He should have flipped that fish. You know, whatever it may be. But in the moment, you did what you thought was right, and unfortunately, you know, you can we could talk about it all day, but that's just how the how the cards played out. And and yeah, just, I guess if it was meant to be, I guess it meant to be. That's what that's what I always say. Hey, I'm right there with you, bro. I, and so was... and I I will say um. I, people people can pick up like if if there's somebody that's on underground or universe or something that watched that people know that you're not the average swim baiter because i will tell you what if it was me that would have lost that fish oh man i there would have been a lot of choice <laughs> words said that rod probably would end up in the back of the boat oh my gosh yeah. i mean yeah. been jumping up and down my feet probably would have gone through the front deck mm. of that boat i mean it's not, yeah. it uh I, I'm very not great at holding back my emotions, especially after uh, after something like that happens. And the oh, fact yeah. that, you know, you still had a couple hours left to fish, you didn't really phase, you know, you're like, man, like, I just, you know, there's going to be another one. I can't believe it. Your, your Demeter, you know, didn't really change. And I feel like that was something that uh, I was just like, wow, like Maddie has, Maddie has his stuff together right now. You know, like he might, he might know, you know, deep down that that fish really, really meant something, but you know, he's, he's calm. He's, he's, confident that he's confident in his abilities that he's going to come across another one or have another chance at a fish that's going to call. And even, you know, even if you didn't, you, you played it off cool. And like I said, there's, 
eight out of ten guys would not that would not how that scenario would have gone. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, bro. I I definitely had a a a slew of choice words and yeah. and and options to do with my rod <laughs> in the moment, um, yeah. but you know ultimately it's like what is that going to do mm -hmm. you know exactly. it's, you're just going to break gonna... something and you're going to be so and you're not going to have you're not going to have a rod to fish for that day you're going to be stuck with well, the it, jerk bait or whatever it may be yeah and if anything it just spins you into a deeper place mm -hmm. like a, in a deeper more negative place that it's really hard to come out of versus yeah. if you're able to keep your self-pity and your dismay and your anger to a, like a really shallow level and not really let it cut you that deep. There's don't, no reaction. Yeah. You don't have that, like that visceral, like, like anger reaction that comes out. in so many of us that happens where it's like, like, I mean, bro, I'm a surfer that grew up in a very competitive lineup. Yeah. Like if someone were to do something stupid, like, yes, I was the kid that go up and like, be very very upset yeah. and like say a lot more choice words than right. I do as an adult <laughs> but like that's it's it's one of those things where I've now learned and it's like the wisdom part right it's like you know what I know how I get mm -hmm. when if I let that really yeah. take me to that place yeah and so if you don't allow yourself to get to that place you're able to kind of dust it off a lot faster and it's mm -hmm. kind of cool because earlier in that day that's when I lost my first seven I lost my first seven and I told my buddy, and I was like, it's fine. It's built milk. Now I know I'm in a good area, whatever. Yeah. Literally five minutes later, that's when I caught that nine pounder. And that was that over that I got in the boat. Yeah. And so it was, it was just like a perfect, uh, perfect storm of like, ah, the universe, like giving you a tap on the shoulder, like good on you, mate. You're all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, dude. It's, uh, I'm the type of person that believes, you know, if something bad happens and, and you give off, you know, bad vibes. I mean, I tell you what I've, I've talked about a lot on the podcast. I've casted off a lot of baits and, you know, nine times out of 10, that ruins my day. And my day just spirals, spirals out of control from there. You leave, you leave or you start fishing angry, you start backlash and you start tying crappy knots, you know, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. start losing fish. And it just, the whole world's against you at that point in time. But mm -hmm. I've, I've come to learn in the last year, you know, if you just, you're cool and composed, you know, you just shake it off when you can, you're not, not overly react, you know, it's not as bad. It's not as bad an hour or two later. Whereas if you're freaking out and like I said, if you do throw your rod, you break your rod or something that that's kind of uh, a future consequence based on a, on a <laughs> reaction. <laughs> yeah. You have bad moments, not bad days. Remember yeah. That. Yeah, man. Exactly. Exactly. Um, last question about fork, uh, Ooh, before the event, so when you were pre-fishing and stuff, did you kind of have an idea that you were going to be fishing a glide bait? Did you, uh, did you kind of practice with the glide bait? And if so, how do you practice? Do you take your hooks off and just kind of look for fish when you're an, at an event and you're kind of using the the glide baits or swim baits kind of as a quote unquote search bait or kind of mm. break that down for us if and when you've, uh, you've kind of experienced that as a tool? Um. I'm going to answer that question and then I'll answer the, 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 yeah, the yeah, fork question because it's kind of funny. No, no, it's perfect because um, I think now with the technology that we have, the search side of it, it's kind yeah, of, I mean, it's, it's now it's like, I day. can, I can search without the cast now, you know, but it's like, I can now like, I can see the body reaction or like, their, yeah, to be able to read their, their broad, their body, um, body movements and, 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 and whatnot. And so it's a little bit different there. Uh, typically when I'm in practice, I will then I'll bend all my hooks in so that I'm not messing with the weight. I oh. think the biggest mistake that people do is they take their hooks off completely and they fish the bait. They're like, dude, I was getting choked on it in practice. And I'm like, guess what? You just altered that bait completely. It's sinking, it's sinking a foot like, faster every two inches now type thing. Exactly. Yeah. Like however that you have that, or however that bait is finely tuned, you have now altered that bait dramatically by removing those hooks. Mm -hmm. And so then, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll, push the barbs down and then I'll flip them. Cause yes, I've still hooked them on flip hooks um, and I'll bend it all the way back. So then the barb is touching the shank of the hook. So then there's minimal gap cause I've hooked them with literally a less than like a half of a centimeter. They and I'm like, how, <laughs> I'm like, how did I hook uh, you with this? And I can barely keep you pinned with like six full tips. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say, you know, I think 
for the fork event, we had a very a special scenario play out. Uh, I'm not a big bed fisherman. Um, I, I'm good at sight fishing. I, I feel confident. Well, like if I find one on a bed, I can catch it. Like for the most part, like, unless like it tells me something that like, yo, like I'm not ready to push up here. But like if that if that female is like anywhere close to the bed and like doing us a, a, some type of pattern to come back to it, like that fish is pretty much catchable. Um, but I'm that's not how I like to fish. I'm not like a Drew Cook or John Cox. Like I'm like gonna actively look out pre spawners. I didn't fish with a glide during practice at all oh, wow. until the very last day in the last 30 minutes. Um, I had found, a, I had established my, 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 my bite. It was going to be pre-spawn bite. I'm suspending in trees, going to scope them in timber. Um, but what really turned it on was like, okay, these fish, their mouth are so hard during this time of year. Uh, they're super rigid. The water's still kind of cold. Uh, it's really hard to keep them pinned. Like even if you have the sharpest brand new hooks, whatever, like you hook them with three treble hooks. It's like your chance of landing that fish goes down just because of just the the nature of the beast. And I knew that like, well, if I hook them with two stout treble hooks and I wrench their face in, then it's yeah. a little different. And I remember it was, it was 30, 30 minutes left in the last day of practice, day three. I knew we were having a big storm roll in. And we had had horrible, horrible conditions. And it was like the kind of conditions that makes every swim baiter like perk up and be like, bro, today's the day. Yeah. And so we, it was horrible conditions. And, and uh, we were rolling into like the first day was going to be stormy as well. And we had like hail and a flurry of snow and all this kind of weird stuff going on. I had seen a, I found this tree that was in the middle of this cut and the tree was in about 12 foot of water. And there were some fish that were perched up on the tree I didn't have my hooks bent in. I literally kept this glide. I had, I had it tied on for Toledo. I didn't retie it since Toledo. I like, I'm like, oh, I pulled it out. Right. I seen him on top of the tree, I like fling it over the tree. I got like three cranks on it. And the biggest one out of the, the group that was up there just like goes up, just smokes the thing. I set the hook and I'm like, eh. <laughs> like reaction, obviously. I'm like, I don't care. Like it's 30 minutes before the end of day. Right. Like this fish is typically not even going to be there again on any other scenario, but pre-spawn a little different, right? So I hook this fish, it comes out, it looks like a seven, like easy, like seven to eight pound fish, like, and it's choked, and then spits the bait. And I was like, yeah, like I was so happy that it spit the bait. It's so like instantly like drop a waypoint. I'm like, all right, sick. I think I know what I'm gonna do tomorrow. Yeah. And so like, I took off everything else from my deck, except for a couple jerk baits and my glide. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had two of them. And uh, and so it was funny. I rolled back into that. And this is the, the day one. I didn't have a camera because I wanted to give a camera to everyone else, obviously. Because yeah. I'm like, they're like, who's this Matty Wong? Is he going to go back and like do good again on court? Like, it sounds dumb. I go back in. I catch a five on the glide. First thing, swing it. I had this. Uh, my my marshal was a, a guide on the lake. And he's like, oh, dude, that's a good one right now. And I'm like, it's sick. <laughs> You know, I lost, I lost um, a bigger one earlier. Oh. But yeah. <laughs> and so we roll up to the same tree that I dumped that bigger fish did on um, during practice. Yeah. Sure, shit, that fish is there's two of them that are still set up. Bigger ones set up a little bit different further down on the tree, and it takes me three or four casts. And you guys can actually watch this on the YouTube. Um, I'll have this coming out pretty soon. But I fire out there, and I'm like, ooh, okay, I got her attention. And you watch me work it back. I get that fish to eat. It's a seven, eight. And uh, right then I was like, dude, like it, it was prime, prime swim bait conditions. Yeah. It was freaking miserable out. It was n like nowhere near like a, a moon, mm -hmm. you know, it was like pre spawn and, and, and windy and whatnot. It was just like, it was just prime. And uh, it's so, to catch that fish and then from there i went on and uh, poked around in some areas that i caught some jerkbait fish and sure enough and i caught two more sevens in those areas <laughs> it was it was dumb dude it was dumb but yeah it's it was neat how i i 
I think now having my experience as a swim baiter, as a tournament angler, and as someone who's on the elites fishing different places around the country, now to look at the conditions and be like, bro, tomorrow it's going to go down. Yeah. And like, it, like a swim bait bite's going to go down. Whether I fall on it or not, like tomorrow's going to be a day. Mm-hmm. And sure, should it happen, you know? And it was that day and the next day. But then the thing that I was worried about is like, well, if I catch him on Saturday or Friday and Saturday, when it comes to Sunday, like what's, what's going to go down? Right. Cause it was going to be completely different. I'm like, you know what? Those are the things you worry about when you get there. And, um, and yeah, it was, it was painful for me to, to watch score tracker change in the last like five mm-hmm. minutes of the day where Cooper Claunt caught a seven pounder and edged me out by ounces. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it wasn't meant to be. It's all yeah. good. Spill yeah. milk. <laughs> um, so when you're, I mean, obviously you swim bait guy, you know, the conditions and obviously you kind of, you pre-fishing you, it's set up pretty, pretty well. Does that make the hair on the back of your neck stand up? Like, okay, you know, you got guys like Zaldane or Kennedy or Milliken, like these guys also know how to, how to sling a big bait. Does that kind of make you think man i gotta kind of be worried about these guys too or are you just are you nah. the type of guy that's more so worried about the fish that you're going for and what you put in the boat it it's easy to get spun out on your heroes right right Online. for me like for me it's like steve kennedy mm-hmm. and and as much as uh zaldane and i switch positions like I, zaldane's another guy that i look yeah. up to like another like probably like a half filipino kid from california (laughs) like made it on tour you know that's a big bait dude like wow that's pretty dope and so it's it was uh, i've learned now not to get in so much in my head when it comes to fishing against these people that you had been so like enamored by growing up Mm -hmm. and and they put on their pants the same way that you do in the morning And, and and just as much as they can get in your head you can also get in theirs right so I think that there's like a fun part of, of, of the chess game there. Mm-hmm. And it, and especially now, like being like my third year on tour, like I know I can get in guys heads. Right. And that's super fun. Yeah. Especially like, bro, they're smoking a 10 inch right now. And they're right. like, they're like, well, shit, is Maddie lying or not? Cause like, yeah. I know he'll throw it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh man. So, funny. Yeah, so it's fun because they, I know that they won't have the confidence to do it. Like right. one of the guys, like, and I won't na- mention names cause it, but it's funny because there's a lot of these guys that I was telling you about like that aren't core swim bait dudes, but then they hear about the bite and they're like, oh, I'm a core swim bait dude. Yeah. And it was like one of the guys I went out, he went to Mickey's shop here. Oh no. <laughs> he went to he went to Mickey's shop. Mickey told me the story, bro. And oh, it was dude. classic. Mickey told me the story. And so like he goes to Mickey's shop and he's like, Hey, do y'all do y'all like sell any 86 baits? <laughs> and oh, Mickey my almost God. <laughs> Oh, that no. And so Mickey is like, also he's like, he's like, bro, this guy doesn't know what he's like walking into. But Mickey and I are cool. But like, it was just, it was like, I can only imagine being in my friend's shoes who came in and asked. He's like, well, Matt, he's catching him on eighty six. So I was wondering if you got an eighty six. <laughs> and so I just like. It was one of those ones that I told, I just laughed because I'm like, dude, I'm just telling you, the guy that asked you is like just genuine as gold and he didn't mean nothing by it, but man, you asked the wrong person, but literally you could have asked any swim bait shop across else. the country, but, but Mickey yeah. shop right there on Fort probably yeah. was on the lowest tier of that list. Yeah. So, but it was, it was funny. He ended up buying one of Mickey's glides and um, Mickey made great baits. I mean, obviously he's a freaking legend. So it's, it's, yeah. it's just funny um, how it, it, when you can get in <laughs> someone else's head, mm-hmm you know, and really kind of like mess with them. Cause I I've seen, I mean, Kevin Van Dam is one of the greatest when it comes to like getting in people's heads Yeah. and Rick Clun says, you know, look at everyone freezing on the dock like when the rain, when it's snowing out and miserable, it's like, look, half of those guys have already lost. Yeah. Like how uncle Ricky, like, he's like, well, they've already defeated themselves. They're talking about how bad the weather is. Yeah. And so it's, it's all the ways that you can get in your own head and like mess with yourself before you even get out of the water so i think it's i think that's something that's like it's fun because me being someone who grew up in hawaii in a small place where it's like the surf lineup is just as much of like a community hole and everyone's trying to get the same nut it's like you're trying to go out and catch a wave but you're gonna get 
punked out by the older guys in the lineup that not are just going to come up to you and share words with you are going to come up to you and slap you off the side of your head. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, and so it's like a whole different, it's funny this like having that as my background to come into a place where I'm like, Oh, I can play with these guys because it's like a mental game of chess. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's uh that was a great question. Cause I think it's, it, that's a, I think even when I get to fishing, it's like Polonic. Like even uh, so last year on the Sabine, when I got third, we had fished the same area um, for our starting or not our starting days, but we had finished like or our main, our main weight yeah. for day one and day two came out of this one little spot. And then I, I went and obviously got on the stuff that I ended up almost winning me the tournament, but I had talked to Brandon. He's like, I'm like, Hey, how pissed would you have been if I told you I caught a five back there? And and whatnot and uh oh shit God, dude. um and uh and he's like I I'm like you wouldn't have been pissed at me and he's like no man and I'm like well, I do I would have been like freaking pissed at you and he's like dude it's a competition like this is part of it and so like ever since then like I'm I've been like you know what hey it's all part of it it's it's part of the deal like and you can't really blame anyone for it obviously it's easy to like take it personally yeah. Because you're like, bro, it's like a judge of character. Like you know, someone's gonna tell you straight, like lie to your face. You're like, okay, well, you can't trust that person again. Right. So I've, I've learned now, like on on the tour, I can only trust a handful of guys, and when I mean a handful, I mean two. Mm-hmm. And and everyone else, like I take with a grain of salt. I mean, there's guys that I I hold in higher regards than others. Right. Um. But it's uh, yeah, it's it's everyone's trying to win a hundred grand. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not like they're trying to be your best friend, even though it's like the whole a kids trying to be your friend. Right. <laughs> I just want to be everyone's friend and be chill with everyone. But then I also realized I'm like, Oh, I also got to make a living too. So yeah, the, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot on, on many different levels there, but it's cool that there's guys like, you know, like Steve Kennedy who almost want, uh, who he, I think he won the clear Lake event yeah. um, in 15 or six. Yeah. When was that? Yeah, I, it was something like I want, that. I feel, I feel like it was 16 or 17 where Kennedy won Clear Lake and it was all off the HUD. And like he was catching him on the outside of the mouse and he was having to throw back five pounders because the, the, the rules oh. were different then. But <laughs> it's crazy. And it's like, I'm like, core, core guys that don't like claim that they're like, oh, I'm a swing biter, man. Like it's like dudes, dudes that just love doing it and they get eaten up by it. And like, can be the goofiest dude in the world, but like, absolutely slays them. Yeah, like, yeah and and that's that's the coolest thing about like the whole just fishing on a whole. It, it fish don't care what what you look like or yeah, you know. Yeah, dude. It, it's it's kind of that's kind of the the cool thing is you can you can be the goofiest guy at the boat ramp. <laughs> if you got the right cadence down on your glide bait or you got the right color jerk bait, those fish don't give a squat one way or another. No, it's game on, dude. Oh man, that's awesome. Well, talked about the the fork event, kind of get getting to the wrapping up of it a little bit. What uh, if if you guys are watching this on YouTube? I'm sure you guys have seen uh, Maddie's uh, sweatshirt, Maddie's hoodie, or Maddie's hat. Um, and that's obviously the lateral vision. If you guys are, I mean, I feel like majority of swim bait guys probably see it. And outside of the swim bait world, I mean, they do the overlanding stuff, they do the hunting stuff. Just a super super cool brand. What's it been yeah. like to work with them? I mean, after it's funny after the the fork event it miraculously lined up that friday that matt was dropping baits <laughs> super super cool by the way because well, yeah. i think that's when i was talking to matt i think that's what he was doing was you know getting getting the, the website and stuff around for that yeah. and that's why i wasn't able to watch and i didn't even yeah. know about it i hadn't been i didn't see his post or anything and i saw a story the one time i sent him the video and i was like oh crap i was like well Merry Christmas. What a way to yeah. advertise a drop. I mean, guys who are watching <laughs> on Bass Track who don't know, don't really know, but all these swim bait guys know, which I thought was super, yeah. super cool. But um, it's it's kind of uh yeah, it, it it's what's it been like to work with those guys? Because while Matt was doing that drop, uh Matt had had actually a collab uh shirt and series drop. And obviously you've had a handful of stuff drop through them as well. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like um you know, when, when I, when I see you, I just always think of the lateral vision. I think of the, the Simpson, the Bart Simpson style yeah. art, and it's just kind of that super cool thing. And actually they did that series after the event too. 
And yeah. I just think that's super cool. So what's that been like for you to kind of, you know, maybe to go to weigh in or go to the classic and see guys wearing lateral vision stuff with, with your animated guy on the back. I mean, it's gotta be, it's gotta be a pretty unique feeling that not many people can say they've ever felt yeah. before. Oh man, it's, it's cool. It's really cool. I, the guys at lateral vision are just incredible humans, you know, like uh, working with a company that cares less about what other people think and cares more about like, they just want to make dope stuff. Yeah, exactly. And whether that's collabs or if it's like their, their apparel or just working with good people, it's like, it's, it's, it's again, it's supporting the underdog, the guys that are making something out of like a passion that they truly like believe in and putting in their, their blood, sweat, time, equity, everything like into something that like, you know, like they're not millionaires, you right. know, it's like, these, we're not all like making a ton of money. It's just, we're doing it because we love it. And, and um, I, I actually worked with them uh, before I got on tour as a photographer and I was like shooting some imagery with them and um and it's just kind of neat on how that relationship is just kind of like blossomed into a, into a thing where now it's all of the all of my collabs that I do with them they they hook me up with 100% of the profits so it's it's like a really great way for one I can help promote them and then in synergy they're able to like help you know put gas in my truck and boat so it's yeah it's uh it's been really neat being able to like to to collab to make some fun like kind of quirky mm -hmm. uh shirts and spinoffs and whatever and <laughs> i was talking to matt about this too like I'm like man like i couldn't have timed it any better huh <laughs> just just like, dude, stars yeah, like, right now like, li like literally it was just like a perfect like the uh the swim bait universe had like all come together yeah. and like and everyone like put their rings in and was like <laughs> the, infinity, <laughs> like, the infinity stones all lined yeah, up or whatever. exactly yeah. like the thanos moment of uh swim baiting came together and it was it was awesome i think it was it 100 meant to be for them and I, i'm really happy that i was able to be a part of that kind of that push for 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 the the swim bait world for lateral for 86 like and um you know i i again it was just like i'm like well dude like I, if i told you i planned it i'd be lying and if i told you i could do it again in a million years i'd also be lying you know right. like it's just one of those things that everything that came together like the way that those fish pulled off because of the cold front like and stayed in the areas that i wanted them to stay and like the way that matt and nick and Cla like lateral all came together to do their collab like it's just it was sick so then i was able to release my glide 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 tourney derb with uh, uh the tourney t um and like it's fun because they they support when i did my whole like uh northern smallmouth thing when i was calling the smallmouth meatballs and so we made like yeah. a fun meatball shirt and so that they made the melon head shirt for, for fort so yeah. it, it's neat to work with a company that really listens to your your ideas that that's down to do something crazy and like off the wall um it's really cool. And again, it just like kind of speaks to the underdog speaks to the, the small business and uh, speaks to like, the people that really like are just, just true core guys that love and gals that love fishing and like love everything uh, that it, that's evolved around the fishing sphere, you know, and, and, and it's just cool to, to kind of, to help give back and be a part of something core versus something that's just like, Oh, we made a million of those, and like our, you know, it's like, nah. yeah, yes, it's, it's it's cool to be a part of a company that's like I feel like, like uh, as a surfer, as uh, someone that spent a lot of time in Southern California, and who's someone who's like truly raised by water to be a part of a company like Lateral Vision that's uh, that stands for a lot of that. Yeah, and I mean, it's such a cool company. They've got designs shirts for everybody like i said they got the overlanding section side of things they have a gajillion bass bass fishing stuff they got all the star wars stuff i mean when when guys are listening to this um the uh the masters will be coming up they did that whole run of Masters shirt i think it was last year maybe two years ago yeah. i mean they yeah. dude they've got they've got all the old retro logos i've got a handful of the uh um the duck the duck hunt the bass hunt shirts I mean, dude, I've got, I've got a lot of, a lot, a lot of their stuff and it's just, you know, you can, it's kind of that side of things where you can wear it out. You know, you can wear it to 
dinner and, and people see that shirt and yeah be like, oh that's a really cool shirt and then you could wear yeah. it to the boat ramp and guys would be like that's a really cool shirt it's just kind of yeah what they what they tapped into is pretty unique and you know it doesn't take a a, a fisherman to um to appreciate the mm, graphic agreed. design or just the shirt in general anybody can see it it's like a it's they they kind of cornered the streetwear market really really well. It's just cool designs that that just so happen to be fishing related. And if you know about yeah. it or not, you still it doesn't take away from the design one bit. Hundred percent. I mean, for for those of you that are hearing this and have maybe not heard of this brand before, I'd I'd, I'd suggest if you were to go and take a look at uh, lateralvisionbrand.com. Super and, uh, super you... cool guys for sure. Yeah, it's it's rad. And it, if you go over to uh, the search bar and search type in Maddie Wong, they'll show up a Maddie Wong capsule and all the things that I've done with them. So anything that you purchase off of that helps directly support me. And you can also use a little code capture fish that gives you a little little discount. And Thank that you. was like my o, my OG YouTube name before I had to switch it. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I huge shout out to Lateral Vision because if it wasn't for them stepping up to the plate, I wouldn't have been able to do my first year on tour and so it's it's kind of cool looking back three years now it's uh you know i'm really happy to be a, a partner of them so awesome man last thing kind of touched on the media stuff you talked about mm -hmm. talked about the youtube talked about uh doing uh filming uh photography for lateral vision and just kind of mm -hmm. youtube channel and stuff in general guys can see i mean at least myself i'm, I'm a big camera guy so i can tell when people go above and beyond with posts like oh this is shot Know, shot on a big Sony cam rather than an iPhone or a GoPro, whatever it may be. So yeah. I, I find a lot of um, enjoyment out of, out of guys who take their time to, to kind of learn big cameras and stuff. So, I mean, that's one thing, your whole Japanese series, like when you go to the tackle shop with uh, Taku E2 and stuff, like, it's just, <laughs> it's just like, man, this is like, you're really there. I'm, I, if I had to guess, it's probably like an a seven, three shot. And I, maybe you're a Canon guy. I don't know, but yeah, like yeah. <laughs> watching it and it's just like, wow, like, this is super cool. It's, it's like, I'm there and not taken away from guys who film on GoPros and stuff, but it means yeah. something else when a guy is carrying or lugging around a big camera with a big oh, SLR. Yeah. Yeah. Properly like a, finding yeah. exposure and yeah, lighting man. it correctly. Yeah. It's like you see that in, in, since I know what it takes to go into that, there's just a, there's just another level of enjoyment. It's like, wow. Like, it's like I it's it's it literally is physically close as I can be to being in that tackle shop with you guys on BWA or wherever you guys were at the time. Like mm -hmm. you, you can't capture that with a GoPro. You can't capture that with an yeah. iPhone. I don't care what iPhone it is. It takes a special yeah. camera with the right settings to capture all that with the, with the right LUTs and everything. It's just like, wow, yeah. like. And, and I always, I always enjoy that. And I kind of, I want to get more guys who are more, you know, camera savvy because that's like the other passion of mine is, is film and, and that sort of thing. And it's just, you're making YouTube videos. Yes. But when a, when a person like myself watches it, it means so much more that, that I can see it. And I, I know what it took to, to get to that. So I guess the question is like, what did you do for lateral vision? And then kind of what did you talk about doing, uh, having your own business and stuff and kind of what was that like? And how has that set you up for where you're at now with the YouTube and everything? Great, great question. Um, lateral, I think it was more so finding creative ways to elevate their product mm -hmm. and whether that's environmental portraiture or still life portraits of Dude. like their product. Yeah, that's like... Um, um, I'm 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 new to the whole merch thing and new to the whole <laughs> product photography and yeah white background with the drop shadow super super cool but it means something else when you go out onto a two track and you take a picture of a shirt that a, a charcoal shirt with the green grass background and you have enough grain to make the picture pop and stuff and it mm -hmm. dude that's a skill and and guys yeah. don't necessarily know that but like that's a huge part part of marketing and for guys like me like i am drawn into that stuff when there's a nice picture with the, like a product picture i'm like i'm so much more inclined to pull the trigger on buying something like that and intrinsically we have something that's within us that when we see something that's aesthetically pleasing mm -hmm. we get drawn to it yeah and i think most people don't understand that that's how marketing works right that's how the things like how us as consumers will then draw lines of 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 like similarity of continuity of like hey that's me that like that talks to me and so for me being an an angler a waterman a fisherman a surfer uh, uh 
skater or whatever understanding that culture it's like look i know what talks to our demographic yeah. let me take some imagery and tell me what you think these are my rates this is what i charge in hollywood and this is how it goes mm -hmm. and they were like well like no one like and most people in the fishing industry yeah. they're like well we don't we don't really pay like that much for it and i'm like well yeah and and which which i had to learn then too it's like yeah in the fishing space it's different like you're not going to get the same ad money that you do with fashion yeah um and uh you know from that relationship that we started in like 2017 um it it, it slowly kind of came together more and more and more to the point where like from one supplying images for them in certain campaigns to then like shooting certain uh certain products for them for like small campaigns or whatever that they had in mind for certain things and then from there to like be part of their team and for them to start supporting me and then ultimately when I turn pro for them to become my, one of my title sponsors is just it's amazing um I think it, it it doesn't go without uh years of the learning experience that I went through um after moving from Hawaii to LA to Los Angeles and learning like okay film uh, i went to film school in hawaii dropped out of the uh, film department there moved to la was acting playing saxophone and and then starting film, uh, still photography i've always been in a phot still photography and i found that like oh wow i can make decent money in stills especially if you know a static especially if you don't call in sick and you know how to work hard like you yeah. can do a lot in the industry and um I really, really dove into it. And that's where I ran that business that allowed me to like free, uh, to, to free fish whenever I wanted. And so having the aesthetic of a, a, someone in the fashion industry who understands what celebrity fashion artists are looking for when it comes to like design, when it comes to color, when it comes to framing, when it comes to wardrobe, and then to then take it to the next level as a technical guy behind like digital text, guys that understand cameras, whether it's yeah. SLR, film, uh, how to find a perfect exposure with 35 millimeter and 200 ISO or ASA like uh, film. And like, so having all that background all combines together into like a place where <clears throat> I have my acting background where I'm like comfortable in front of the camera. I have like my film and photo background that I understand um, technical side of things. Yeah. I have my lighting background that I lit for, I mean, anyone who listens to Cardi B, Justin Bieber, um, uh, you name it, I've shot all their music or all their uh, their cover albums um, and album art and like Ariana Grande. And it's like I've I've learned through being in that industry what the studios are looking for, which yeah. are like these multi freaking million dollar industries that are like scrutinizing everything that like this is what we want to put out so i'm like learning okay these are the aesthetics that they want out how do i achieve that aesthetic yeah. but then now how do i bring this into the fishing world and then be able to create a product that people are like oh this is awesome right and so it's it, it was a, a mixture of a lot of things that all came together and to be honest it was like a perfect storm yeah, kind of like how the eighty six baits and Matt and Lateral came together. It was literally like I, yeah. I couldn't have planned it better for me to all to turn pro and to be on the Elite Series. Mm -hmm. So it's um, yeah, it's been an absolutely humbling experience, and I'm yeah, I'm freaking pumped that I'm in this position because yeah. I if I were to tell little six year old me in Hawaii that one day I'd be a professional bass fisherman fishing on live television or fishing the Bassmaster Classic, I would have been like, you're a liar. While, <laughs> while he's, while six-year-old you is trying to make you pack a 10 flukes last him for, for five or yeah. six months at a time. That's, that's the truth. Man, yeah, so, that's so awesome, it, man. <clears throat> it's, so, uh, so cool. it's pretty wild, man. So I just always like to encourage people, like, do what really makes you happy ultimately. And, and um, you know, life will find its way to figure it out. And, you know, it's... Heck yeah, dude don't give up there you go wise words from maddie wong man so before we wrap it up dude what uh where are the social medias that guys can can follow you if they're not already youtube instagram i don't know mm -hmm. if you have a facebook page but tiktok yep. everything you got list it and i'll put it in the description so oh, guys can head over there thank and follow you. you well uh yeah if you uh don't subscribe to the youtube that'd be awesome i do a month uh sorry a weekly drop um I, well when i'm not fishing tournaments but i do a weekly drop on my maddie wong fishing 
and uh, you can go back and watch me fish out of my old ranger. And I do, you know, adventure episodes in the series I did in Japan, which has really uh, gained Super. some traction Super. to fly fishing in New Zealand to, you know, all, just you name it. Um, I'm just ultimately ate up by angling on a hole. Um, and uh, yeah, I do TikTok. It's Maddie. I believe it's Maddie Wong fishing on TikTok as well. Yeah, there's like an underscore yeah. in there, I think, somewhere. Uh, maybe, maybe there's on, on 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 Instagram, it's Maddie underscore Wong, and then on uh, Facebook, it's Maddie Wong fishing, and that's a page. If you can follow it and like it, that'd be awesome. But yeah, I mean, ultimately, that would things to support me or to follow me on those on those uh, platforms and buy some Maddie Wong lateral vert merch and uh yeah send me a message and tag me in some stuff and you know like uh i'm always here for people i always try to be when it comes to you know direct messages on on online or whatever and especially like uh, any younger kids that are trying to get into it that have the dream or even older kids like myself <laughs> because you know what there's always the dream to have and it can always happen and it's one of those things it's age isn't a Age isn't a factor um, in this sport, which is really special. It's one of those things I, I know that as a surfer, like you come to a certain point where you can't surf anymore mm -hmm. or surf where you would want to. Yeah. But then you look at guys like Rick Clunt, who's in his 70s, who's mm -hmm. com still competing against right. like the top yeah. 100 in the world. It's been doing so, it for 45 years. I mean, who's been doing it for going on 50 years. 50 dude. years, yeah. So which is just absolutely insane. Yeah. So it, it, it's a cool thing to be uh, like a people's champ of, of, of all ages uh of someone to help inspire people to really you know what you're never too young or too old to to to, to chase a passion and to follow a dream and um it can happen and, and if, if it's meant to be it'll it'll, it'll, it'll all unravel for you so thank you i appreciate the talks bro i had a good time yeah dude um as always i want to thank you for coming on man i shot you a, a dm I, I think I had made a post or I'd made a story post after fork and you had liked it or whatever. And then I, we kind of talked back and forth and the class could come up and I was like, Oh, well you're like, I got to go to the class. I said, that's fine. So I'm glad, I'm glad we got on to here and got on to talk. Like I said, I'm sure you'd been on a couple podcasts, but I hope that uh, guys who listen to this one, you'd drop some stuff or maybe I'd ask some questions that came at it from a different angle that other people had, had done. That's kind of, that's kind of the goal is to kind of give a different perspective to, to questions and stuff. Um, oh, I was, I was going to have something else to say. <clears throat> I can't remember what it was, but Maddie, I appreciate you coming on, man. You're a busy, busy no man. Um, I will say if you guys are on TikTok and in Maddie's live, he was live. Oh man, this was before the Lake Fork tournament and I hopped on there. Uh, yeah. Got to, got to have a good talk. You were rigging up and you're going through all your swim bait boxes and stuff. So yeah. I had to see a bunch of your baits and everything. So that was, Oh, fun. you were probably the one that was commenting in like yeah. naming half of them. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's man. classic. It's, it's super cool yeah. when guys, um, guys, especially on the elite series, are super personable and and kind of, uh, you can go on there and talk and I mean just have you on the podcast. I've reached out to a couple guys and just you know their schedules have conflicted and you know I haven't reached back out, but um, I, I I have some friends who are who are mutual friends with you and stuff and they're like yeah you should you should really try to get them on. So I'm like okay I will, and yeah. I'm, I'm glad I'm glad we were able to uh, to set this time aside and get you on man. Kind of a long one I think. I think it's close to two hours, but oh, dude, it's gonna be a good listen for you guys that have hung out. I feel like I feel like it was a really good one. Um, we got to talk about a whole lot. Got to talk about your backstory and everything else, and kind of the camera side of things and Lake Fork and and all that good stuff. But as always, I want to thank Maddie for coming on. Um, I will say when you guys are listening to this, the uh, Volume Two First Issue Magazine will be pre-ordering here soon. I should be getting it within the week when you guys are hearing this, and then I'll open up the pre-order on Friday, which is like April. I don't even know what day it is. So keep your guys' eyes out on that. Facebook and Instagram, that'll get uh, get the update on there. We had Mr. Mike Booker write up a huge section, so he was kind of the headline uh, headline builder awesome. in the cover of that. But as always, I want to thank Maddie for coming on. I will have all of his stuff in the show notes. You guys can go follow him, buy some merch or, or whatever it may be. If you guys want to go watch his YouTube channel, you guys can go do that. But as always, Maddie, I want to thank you coming on for coming on, man. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Thank you, guys.